Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Today's class is Getting Ready for Fall. Nancy Berlin, our Natural Resources Specialist and Master Gardener Coordinator, um, will be presenting this morning. Hey, who's excited for fall? I, I think I, I'm ready for it. This is going to take the not quite 30,000 foot level look at getting ready for fall, but more like the thousand foot level because I'm going to cover a lot of topics briefly, but I'm going to refer you to resources for each topic that are on our YouTube channel. So you might want to watch, write this down, VCE Prince William YouTube, put that in your Google search. And then there'll be other links in here too, and you'll be able to view this presentation at a slower version on YouTube later. You'll receive the link and an evaluation after class from Christina Hastings. Please be sure to return the evaluation. We're getting a lot of uh, good feedback and helpful suggestions and ideas for upcoming classes. So that is really valuable to us. So thanks for joining us today and let's get started. So these are the topics we're going to cover. And again, about the thousand foot level, um, because this is a lot to cover in one, in one hour. We'll finish a little bit early and we'll take questions at the end, but there are several master gardeners that are staffing the chat box. If you have questions, um, they, they can answer some in real time for you too. So trees and shrubs have really taken a beating this year, you know, with the really wet spring and the really hot, hot drought, droughty weather that we've had all summer and now last night's um, superstorm. They're really struggling. We've had a lot of calls about oak trees. This is a sycamore, and sycamores uh, tr in our area often will lose their leaves early due to anthracnose. It's a fungal disease. Sometimes they'll leaf out again before the winter time comes. So we're going to talk a good amount about tree care, uh, and we're going to have another class specifically on trees later this month. Um, uh, I'll give you some research-based tips. So planting in the fall is more forgiving than planting in the spring. Although this spring was really good, I think I got overzealous planting this spring because the weather was so cool and I had plenty of moisture. Uh, but that's, that's not always the case. Fall is a little cooler. It's um, easier for a tree to establish. Um, it will lose its leaves, so it's not, uh, it's not producing as, as much food for itself. And so the root growth takes um, precedence. So, but be sure you plant it correctly. You see this photo and the bottom shows the trunk flare. That flare needs to be above the soil line and there needs to be no mulch on it. That's the way you plant a healthy tree with as less stress as you can, as little stress as you can. A lot of times that flare is hidden under the soil in the pot or under mulch or, or under girdling roots. So make sure that first off, that that's above the soil line, even if you have to kind of excavate the soil in the pot before you plant it. Uh, for mulching, you want to keep the mulch away from the trunk, and you want to mulch to the drip line. I mean, that's ideal. I'm still working toward that on some of my trees, and because the tree, the tree roots go out, I'll show you some more pictures about uh, the trees go out and instead of going down. So don't make a mulch volcano, keep it away from the tree trunk, especially that root flare zone. And I would recommend using wood chips or composted leaves for the best mulch. Certainly you can buy commercial brands, uh, but if you, if you mulch, um, mulch correctly. Arborist wood chips are shown on the left and um, you can get a chip drop from Novak. All you have to do is Google chip drop Prince William County or chip drop Manassas, but it is a lot of chips. <laughs> It, it's probably as tall as my little SUV, tall and, and maybe just as wide. So it's a lot. So make sure you can use what you have. And they, they just drop it up in my driveway. And I use that for mulching. And that's really ideal because it doesn't get matted. It allows for a lot of um, air, water to get through, air for the roots, for oxygen for the roots. And, it, and it's free. So I, I would recommend you look into that, but you can also use leaf mold and Fine Gardening had a really nice article on preparing leaf mold. You can see that that's at the right. So trees and shrubs, um, many times we'll have questions about why is my tree dying? And the first thing we look at is how it's planted, how it's mulched. And then we usually ask, 
how much is it irrigated? And almost all the time, people say, I don't irrigate it, it's the rain irrigates it. And as you know, this past year has been really brutal. And um, there hasn't been enough to irrigate trees just with rainfall. I would encourage you to come up with a plan to irrigate your trees and shrubs weekly until the ground freezes if rainfall is insufficient. Now, last night should hold us for a little while. That was quite a storm. And how much water? Well, young trees need a little more monitoring and coddling than, than um, more mature trees. And if a tree is stressed or seems to be being attacked more often by insects or has disease, it may need more monitoring for water needs. And of course, some species need more water, hydrangeas and maples. And site conditions are certainly a factor to how much water is needed, whether it's on a slope or at the top of the slope or the bottom of the slope, or whether it's a flat, wet area. Make sure the tree is in the right place. Some trees do fine with uh, a flat area that could be wet, but other trees will, will not do well in that position. We can always advise you on a tree for a certain site if you can give us a description and the size. And I'll, I'll give you our email later that you can ask that question. If you're going to be away, I mean, does anybody get away anymore? <laughs> um, I'm hoping um, to get away at some point, but if you're going to be away for newly planted trees, you might want to consider a gator bag. This isn't a permanent solution. This is a short-term solution. You put a gator bag on a newly planted tree. Don't leave it on indefinitely. Remove it and store it during the winter. But this is just a bag. It has handles on the top. You can see the handles right here. And it has a zipper down the side. And, and you fill, up, fill it up with a hose. Many times I'll see gator bags that are empty sitting on trees. And the reason we don't want to leave it on long or empty is because that insects, voles, disease can develop underneath the bag. So use it only when needed and make sure it's full. Gives you a nice slow drip. So make it easy on yourself. I find I don't wanna water very much if I have to drag the hose in from the front to the back or if, I, if it's too short and I have to do a bucket run for some of the far away trees. So make it easy on yourself. Plan ahead and get appropriate hoses. Make it convenient. Drip irrigation allows for slower infiltration. It's more cost effective, of course. You don't want to use a sprinkler. A sprinkler doesn't do an adequate job for a tree, or either a soaker hose or some kind of drip irrigation, or hand watering. I like hand watering because I can watch and see if the ground is absorbing the water, or whether it might be too compacted or, or and the water's running off, or it, um, if I might be giving it too much, if I'm not paying attention, I'm watching the birds in the yard instead of paying attention. So check to see whether the water infiltrates about six to 12 inches. You can test with your finger. You can put a, drive a little dowel right down there and put your finger down in there. <coughs> if you're irrigating your lawn, that doesn't irrigate trees sufficiently. They need more than that. And besides, the lawn is gonna win. It's gonna, it has so many more roots and it's gonna, take the water before the tree ever gets a chance. Keep your turf away from your trees by mulching out of the drip line. That allows the tree to not have turf competition. Or you can join your trees together in a mulched island, mulching properly, of course, and you can water near the drip line where the feeder roots are. And I have a picture of that. Let's see here. So here's the feeder roots and they absorb the water and the nutrients and those anchor roots in the middle secure the tree to the ground. Mature trees need water about once a month uh, when the soil is dry, uh, 12 inches below the surface area. You, again, water near the drip line, about 10 gallons per inch of tree circumference. Now my water bill really went up this last month, but I also have an investment in my trees. So I'll, I'll show you what, what plan I follow in just a minute. But young trees, about, again, 10 to 15 gallons per inch of trunk, so they'll need less than the mature tree but they'll need monitoring. Uh, hand watering does allow you to observe that infiltration though. So this is the way a tree grows. It doesn't grow down, it grows out. The ideal watering zone is where those feeder roots are and that's sometimes past the drip line. This is my property and I don't know why I never thought of this on my own, but a master gardener says she, she irrigates by zone. And so I started dividing my property into zones. This is certainly not all the zones I have, but um, so I don't have to remember. I do it in a clockwise 
matter. And if it's real droughty and there hasn't been insufficient weight rainfall, I'll take all the, all the all the plants in that zone area, one of the blue areas, and just kind of rotate around the yard. And that helps me remember, oh, I did that one yesterday, so I must be on the next one. That is so simple. And our, our master gardener, Ruth, is the one that said that. And I thought, why have I never thought of this? It just makes it easier on me because my memory isn't the best these days. So when you're planting trees, <clears throat> they will often look like that when you take them out of the burlap or the pot. And you can see those roots um, on here are, you know, circling. And you can see the root flare on this, which is good. That should be above the soil line. But these roots will continue to circle if you plant it like that. And the tree will um, not be able to absorb water and nutrients. And it will become unstable. And some of the wind-thrown trees that we see are just for that reason. They've been planted and the root ball stays in, the, in that root area and it doesn't expand out horizontally. Remove burlap, remove cages, remove string, give it a chance and you wanna free those roots. So if any roots are circling, you're gonna cut those. You can see this tree on the, this tree on the right, the roots are spread out kind of like in a fan shape. They shouldn't be all balled up in, like they were in the container. So spread the roots out in the planting hole. The planting hole should be about two to three times the size of the root ball. And again, keep that root flare above the soil line. So let's talk about leaves for a minute. It used to be that we, you know, oh, the well-kept garden would be putting the garden to bed, go out and clean everything up, mulch everything, and get everything ready for winter. But things have changed. The research is showing leaves are critical habitat for a lot of our butterflies, our beetles, bees, and moss, and also birds forage in that area for their food, for high protein food. So the Xerxes Society and many other um, groups are recommending that you leave the leaves. Leaves aren't litter. They, this is their campaign to get you to not rake up all the leaves and put them in a bag and put them out for the trash to pick up. <clears throat> leaves are very rich in nutrients. Um, so I would recommend that you consider this. Leaving the leaves, unless you have, you know, really nice turf that you don't want to uh, get smothered, rake those leaves or rake those leaves into a natural area. I have a kind of a, a natural garden along a fence and I just kind of pile them up where there's no plants along the fence in a gentle way so that any critters that are in there can um, survive. Or you can compost them and put them around trees. Now, avoid piling them up against the trunk though. There, this is just a few pictures of the critters that need those leaves that we're hauling away to the landfill. That's the red banded hair streak on the left. Um, and it's, it lays its eggs in the, in the leaf litter. This is a lightning bug larva. You know, our lightning bugs are declining and I certainly wouldn't want my grandchildren to grow up in a world without lightning bugs. So they require leaf litter for their life cycle. That's where they overwinter. This is a queen bumblebee and she overwinters in, the, in leaf litter also. Shredded leaves won't provide the same cover, but certainly if you have a lawn area, I will refer you to a podcast by Mike Goatley about how to shred the leaves uh, and, uh, and leave them on your lawn. But remember that shredded leaves, you're, are, you're gonna have some attrition of um, these critters if you do that. So you gotta kind of come up with a plan ahead of time. What am I gonna do with these? You can always put them in your compost pile. If you Google <coughs> leave the leaves, it's a Virginia Tech podcast with Mike Goatling. Here's the link, but you can just Google that, Leave the Leaves Virginia Tech podcast. And um, it, it's a short podcast. I think it was like three minutes. And he talks about what to do with leaves for your lawn's sake. And so if you, want, if you have a nice lawn area that you want to keep the leaves off of it, he gives you some suggestions. There's also a Virginia Tech publication. All you have to do is Google Virginia Tech publication making compost from yard waste in your Google search and it will give you some instructions on how, how best to use that the valuable resource of your leaves in your yard. So let's talk about pruning for just a minute. I would recommend that you save the pruning of hardwood trees um, until dormancy. Now dormancy means the quiet time when the after the tree loses its leaves and you get a frost or consistent frost and the tree is kind of in 
maintenance mode. It does have some root growth under the, you know, under the ground. There's a lot going on, even though above the surface, it looks like it's quite inactive. But the three Ds, you can prune these anytime, dead, diseased, or damaged. Um, you can see um, this, this uh, branch right here has a canker on it, and um, it probably would benefit from getting cut off because that's just a little breeding ground for fungal spores. You want to make the cut at the root collar, right? Like right here, you want to protect. You want to protect the um, trunk. There's some pruning recommendations and some other pictures on the Virginia Tech site. If you Google Virginia Tech publications pruning, there's any number of um, uh, rec uh, recommendations and pictures for you. Uh, if you have a, a damaged branch that it's it's split, I have one of those in the backyard now. I need to go take out out uh, this afternoon. Uh, you want to cut that off too. Or if it's dead, you can cut that. These three Ds anytime. But if you and if you don't, if you if you leave it exposed, then that's a good entry point for disease and insects to come in, as well as being a hazard to your family. So another thing you can talk, think about this fall, this is kind of exciting, is to um, do some hardwood cuttings. And the right timing for this is after the leaves have fallen. And you can make a cut about pencil sized, uh, looking for where the new growth um, joins the older growth. Oops, that's, that should say new growth. Where um, this year's growth, oh, that's correct. Where this year's growth joins the older wood. And make a clean cut, make sure your uh, tools are clean. Uh, you can uh, nine to one water to bleach would clean it sufficiently. And then um, I usually use rooting hormone and the nice thing about hardwood cuttings is they don't need, they don't need light. Uh, they should not have light because you don't want them to leaf out. You want the root, root growth to occur. So you can put them in soil, uh, and, but you do need to keep them moist. Clemson has a really nice fact sheet with some good pictures. And there's lots of YouTube presentations on taking hardwood cuttings. So I encourage you to check those out uh, for a little bit more information. If, just a tip to find research-based information. Um, I would say your Google terms should say hardwoodcuttings.ext or hardwoodcuttings.edu. And um, unless it's a, uh, something that's specific to the Mid-Atlantic, um, you can usually find um, really good information either on YouTube or extension websites by do, putting those search terms in. Let's talk about perennials. It's a toss-up for me. I know this is kind of odd, but it's a toss up whether I like winter seed heads better or the flowers of summer and spring. I think I like them both. And so I plant a lot of things because I like the way they look in the winter. So let's talk uh, a little bit about perennials. You can soil test every three years, which is probably a good thing to do. And we can, eat, we can send you a soil test in the mail uh, since our office is not open for visitors unless you have an appointment. Um, so we can mail you one if you just email us at mastergardener at pwcgov.org. It's $10. So you collect the soil. You fill out the form. It's cost, you put a $10 check in and you mail it to Virginia Tech. And we get a copy of those results. We can pull those up on the database and we can talk you through. They send the report to you also, but we can help you to interpret it if you have any questions at all. I would recommend you think about putting some natives in your yard for habitat, for pollinators, uh, for beauty, for uh, more ease of care. And this is an excellent site to go to, plantnovanatives.org. It has native plants for the Northern Virginia area. It's a great resource and has lots of good um, lists of plants for wet areas, deer resistant, um, grass alternatives in the back of it. So take a look at that. It's available as a PDF online. When we're, we're leaving a lot of the leaves, and we also recommend that you leave some stems in the, in the wintertime too, because especially the hollow stems, like a, a bee balm, some of the, some of the aster families, uh, insects use those as a little shelter in the winter months. So we don't wanna cut down all the stems and take them away because um, that will take away some of our beneficial insects at the same time. They'll lay their eggs in there. Sometimes you'll see a stem with a tiny little hole in it, and you can, you, you can be sure that somebody's living in there. However, let me caution you that if there's disease material, 
do not leave that all winter because that will spread uh, disease pathogens throughout your uh, landscape. And most home composting piles don't reach 150 to 180 degrees, and that kills most weed seeds and plant pathogens. Um, for many home gardeners, it's best to just dispose of disease material. This picture right here is a virus that's common, getting more and more common on roses. It's rose rosette. It causes um, witches brooming uh, on the ends, and the, the thorns are supple. Uh, they're not hard. Red growth on roses is normal, but uh, it's excessively red on rose rosette disease. So if you see that, you need to remove that plant and don't compost it. The middle picture, you see some leaf spots, or you also see here a thistle seed that you probably don't want seeding in your yard. So you don't want to put that in the compost pile because your compost pile is probably not hot enough to obliterate that so it doesn't spread in your yard. And of course, in the vegetable garden, you um, often will have end of the season uh, fungal spots on your leaves or curling up, anthracnose. Uh, other diseases, and so you want to remove those and not leave them in the soil. So leave your spent, again, leave your spent perennials that add winter interest to your landscape, that provide food for birds, and again, they shelter beneficial insects all winter. I leave them about, I don't leave them all because I don't want everything to reseed, but I'll cut things at about 18 inches, um, the things that I don't want to reseed. And some of the low-growing evergreen perennials like cucras or golden ragwort or hellebores or some of the moss flocks, um, leave them because they, they will provide uh, soil stabi stability with their roots. Now you can, you should think about improving your soil because soil is where it's at with any plant. We need to improve the soil, but too much compost, there is such thing as too much compost. So if you add, if you're adding compost every year, you might want to consider doing a soil test, uh, asking us to mail you a soil test kit for Virginia Tech. Um, at, our, at our teaching garden, we found there are some places that we think that too much compost is added, and um, that makes a, a great breeding ground for some of the fungal pathogens that are in the root systems. Now, fungal pathogens are everywhere. They're all around. We just need to make the conditions right for them to thrive. And sometimes if you have too much compost, which can bring lots of great beneficial insects in. It can also um, hold water a little bit too much. So I, I, don't, I don't have a rule of thumb, but many of the extension offices said not more than one to two inches, and you might not need to do that every year. So here's a living mulch too. Um, maybe you haven't heard of that, but uh, ground cover plants can act as a living mulch so you don't have to add wood, wood chips or leaf mold. <laughs> the roots will protect the soil and keep it um, protected all winter. And these, this packer aria here, the, the uh, yellow flowers are in the spring, but the basil leaves last all winter and they're, they're fairly evergreen. For vegetable gardens, crimson clover is a good idea, or um, you can see that picture has, also has uh, annual cereal rye in it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in, a, in some of the next slides. Another uh, living mulch ground cover could be a carex or a sedge, and that keeps the ground covered and um, protected. Or even common blue violets. Some people think those are weeds, but I, I think they're a great, they, they certainly hold the soil well and they provide uh, cover so that winter weeds don't, don't have it as much of a chance. If you're gonna use uh, manure, make sure, it's work, make sure it's well composted and about an inch uh, you could put that in annually, but again, check your soil for water holding capability and you might want to do a soil test. Beware of any manure that might have any herbicide in it, so be careful where you get your manure. We've seen problems with persistent herbicide um, staying in the, in the manure after it passes through the animal and causing herbicide damages to plants. If you keep adding compost um, every year in large amounts, you may end up with a buildup of phosphorus. Thomas, do you have any comment on that? There is a fine line between enough compost and too much compost. Typically with perennials, where you've got ground cover throughout the year, you don't need to add as much compost because um, you're really not taking away any nutrients. With annual beds, with vegetable beds, crop beds, things like that, because you're removing part of the nutrients you want to re replenish them and you're not really so much replenishing the nutrients as you're replenishing the carbon to keep the microbes happy but 
if they're living roots in the ground at all times, that's going to keep the microbes happier than adding compost. So if you have perennial beds, minimal compost is good, except when you're establishing them. Okay, for dividing perennials, that's something we do either in the spring or the fall. And usually there's too many other things to do in the spring, so I usually leave this to the fall. Remember, your perennials are going to sleep the first year, creep the second year, and the third year. And so by the time they're leaping, you're going to want to um, probably divide those. You can see this is an Autumn Joy sedum here, and it, they tend to get real tall and lanky, and then they fall apart in the middle. That's a pretty good sign. If they're doing that, you might need to divide them. Um, so you want, just want to dig around the plant, leaving as large a ball, uh, large a soil ball as possible, and lift the clump out of the ground, and then divide it into smaller clumps. If, it's, if they're real hard to separate, just kind of tease the roots apart, or I've even cut it with one of those gardening knives. Um, if it's tangled, just pry them apart gently. Make sure your tools are clean and sharp. Again, a ble bleach to water, one part bleach to nine parts of water, and then I would rinse them, rinse them after that. Discard anything that looks diseased or slimy or, um, and, and just save the healthier sections. Uh, roots that are healthy should be white and sturdy, not slimy. Here's a few other perennials that you can, these are just one small portion of all the perennials that look beautiful in the winter. Uh, the Northern Sea Oats is a great ornamental grass. It's native, Echinacea, of course, with the snow on top, and or Rebecca triloba. And um, my yard is filled with birds because we leave the seed heads on for them. And um, those goldfinches are already uh, in my yard every day until I walk out the door, and then they flit away. But save some of your seeds for next year's garden, too. Here's some zinnia seeds and you can get rid of the chaff. There is a great YouTube video on our YouTube channel. Uh, we partnered with Fairfax County Extension and uh, got Kathy Benz, Kathy Jens, excuse me, who is the Washington Gardener um, Magazine and a, she's a garden blogger and she came and did a, a Zoom class for us on seed saving. So go to, go to our YouTube and check that out. It's a, it's, it is a longer YouTube. It's about an hour and 15 minutes, I think but it's well worth if you are interested in saving some seeds. She gives you all step-by-step -step instructions. So think about what you can add native-wise to your um, garden for um, fall color and to extend the season for your pollinators. You know, pollinators get a little crazy at, at the end of the summer when there are less blooms around. And so you wanna make sure you're providing a, a flow of nectar, pollen sources, all through the season, including into the fall. These are just two plants that I would recommend you take a look at. Um, Smooth Blue Aster, gorgeous uh, in the fall. Um, I like it, the, the orange and the purple together, uh, yellowish orange, um, and really uh, covered with uh, pollinators. Solidago or wreath goldenrod is another lovely one. It's fairly well behaved rather than the just straight species of goldenrod. And I would recommend you consider these instead of planting mums and pansies that add little, little to the ecosystem. I actually have pansies <laughs> too, and, but, but mums provide no nectar. The most of them are sterile. A pot on your doorstep is not going to affect the ecosystem, but consider putting these in your yard for, um, to help out our pollinators and beneficial insects in the fall, fall months. Consider putting in some annuals or bulbs. Uh, most, we're going to talk mostly about bulbs here. This is a native Irish cristata that you plant in the fall and it blooms in the spring. Really sweet little iris. It's only about six inches tall. These are both non-natives, but I, I love them. They're, this is drumstick allium and fritillaria. They give you a boost in the spring. And it's like getting a present every day when you walk through your garden in the spring, because I usually forget what I've planted. And then I'm always surprised when I see them. So um, you can plant these bulbs anytime until the ground is frozen. And sometimes I'll wait till the end of the season before I purchase them because they go on sale. But you want to, if it's really cold and it frosts uh, and the ground freezes shortly after you planted, check that they haven't heaved out of the ground because that freezing and thawing can push that bulb up to the surface. Um, alliums are um, deer resistant too. Try some new bulbs this year. 
Uh, there are lots of great online bulb um, uh, dealers. And hardy bulbs are usually planted about two to three times their height. For tender bulbs, wait, wait until spring to plant those. You can mix in a slow-release fertilizer like bone meal if it's indicated by the soil test, but usually phosphorus is sufficient in our soils, and you probably won't need it. Um, a soil test would tell you that. But most bulbs, of course, perform, perform better in soil rich in organic matter, and if you've been doing your adding of um, compost, um, that should be just perfect for um, planting bulbs. And you might want to consider thinking about winter sowing. This is a little more extensive than I have done, but some of our master gardeners have done this winter sowing with great success. You can do vegetables, perennials, natives, annuals, and it, it really just involves creating a little greenhouse with, a, you can see they've used salad containers, and those salad containers probably should have a lid on them. And the milk jugs that are cut and taped in the middle, um, seeds planted in potting soil inside, and checking for moisture, but you can, you can read more about winter sowing. There's a Facebook page on winter sowing that, fairly good advice. Um, be cautious of anything that's not .ext, but this um, uh, Penn, Penn State has a great winter sowing uh, publication, and so does the University of Illinois. And so you can go there and learn more about winter sowing. Uh, and it's a very economical way to start a lot of new plants, probably more than you can even get to. I mean, Think about putting in a fall container garden. And here's some examples of things that will bloom in the uh, late, late summer, fall. And here are some, a list of um, some natives that I have recommended for containers um, mint, uh, that'll keep it contained. Some coneflower, landscape coreopsis is still blooming up a storm by the time um, fall comes. Uh, some of the sunflowers, the oats, sedges. Um, and you can Google native plants in containers and put Audubon at home and they have a really nice publication there for you to take a look at some other um, combinations that you could use in a fall container that will be for native plants for fall containers. I'll talk a minute here about fall lawn care. Fall is the time, the right time to fertilize and add amendments to soil, overseed, compost, aerate if you're going to. And our Best Lawns program is the best way to do that. Um, we offer this awesome service for $40. You get a Best Lawns handbook. You get a site visit by Master Gardener volunteers to evaluate your lawn, identify all the weeds, measure the turf areas, and so that we can give you a recommendation that tells you precisely how much lime and how much fertilizer you need to add and how to do it, step-by-step -step instructions you get a comprehensive report with steps to follow. So you can find out more about that by going to the Prince William County website and putting in best lawns in the search terms, terms. or Natalie Walker is our environmental educator who is heading up that program and she would be glad to help you also. You might wanna eliminate turf in the shady places. We have so many people that want to continue to, to off, have turf under trees and, and turf is just not, made for under trees or in shady areas. It needs six to eight hours of sunshine. So consider, us, consider some turf alternatives, and Natalie will be talking about that next Wednesday, August 19th on Zoom. So make sure you register for that with our Master Gardener desks to receive the link. And I think you'll find that really interesting. And I think this is Sedum Ternatum, and that's a, a good sedum for shade. It's, it's a native plant, loved by bees, um, makes a lovely ground cover, and you'll stop beating your head against the wall trying to grow turf where it won't grow well. Eliminate your turf in difficult to mow areas. So trees want to communicate with their root system. So this is just an example of trees that are joined in an island because trees and turf do not get along. They're not good companions. Turf will always outcompete tree roots for water and nutrients. And there is a chemical disadvantage that the turf sends out. It's a cholelopathy and it creates a problem for the roots and the roots won't want to go in there. Um, islands make mowing easier um, and results in less damage of weed whackers to trees. Um, so consider, you know, making your mowing easier, protecting your trees by uh, making a better environment for them to grow. If you need a weed identified, you can email us uh, photos and we'll give you control recommendations. But remember, 
A thick, healthy turf is the best solution to weeds, and you can get that by following the Best Lawns program, and we can send you an application for that. Fall lawn care generally includes aeration, composting, soil testing, fertilizing, and overseeding. It may need a renovation too. For do-it-yourselfers, we can talk you through the process that we follow for Best Lawns, and you would start with your own soil test. Best Lawns includes a soil test in the fee. And you can amend based on the soil test with fertilizer and lime. You would need to know your square footage um, and, and you need to subtract out the deck and the sidewalks and any trees so that you're not over fertilizing. Again, composting the lawn area is probably a good idea. Thomas, would you say annually? And uh, you can air it periodically. You don't have to do that annually. I would say call us and we can talk you through the process or we have a 12 Steps to a Greener Lawn presentation on our VCE Prince William YouTube. For a plan written by VCE though, enroll in our Best Lawns program. You can email us for an for a, um, application. So for weed management, fall is the time that cool season weeds are starting to grow. I haven't seen any yet, but I know they're under the soil just waiting to pop out and um, this is the time when it's growing and translocating food through the plant and that many of our winter weeds are treated with herbicide in the fall. Should you not want to use herbicide, you can hand pull them early in the fall before they go to seed. For example, this bittercress here, this bittercress um, is, will start to pop up probably late August, early September. And if you get it now, when it's at this rosette stage, it will not send out seeds that will hit you in the eye. Wild strawberry, um, wild garlic, here's dead nettle and henbit. Those are some of the winter weeds you'll see coming very soon. Decide on what your weed tolerance is. I have a very high weed tolerance. If they do a job or they're holding soil and they're not aggressive, I generally let them be. There will be some leftover summer weeds and these have either completed their life cycle or they'll die with the first frost. So don't treat them with herbicide. That's that's a waste of chemical and it, that chemical will be in the environment. So hand pull these um, before they go to seed. Um, this, is, this is stilt grass and it's probably, if it hasn't gone to seed already in your yard, it's, it's going to and it's gonna send out thousands and thousands of seeds per plant. This is spurge, has a milky substance in the stems that can be hand pulled. And, and of course, the turf is very, um, very thin crabgrass occurs or at, on the edges. Here's some lawn online resources. There's troublesome lawn weeds are at Virginia Tech's um, turfweeds.net, fall strategies for lawn care, our best lawns program, Natalie Walker. Or again, we have a video uh, Zoom, Zoom class on our BC Prince William YouTube for 12 steps to a greener lawn. So I'm gonna briefly Cover vegetables. Let me see what time it is. Okay. Um, again, soil testing. If you if you haven't soil tested in three years, soil test your vegetable garden. And the reason is this chart at the right. Getting the pH right is very important. You, um, if unless you have the right pH in your vegetable garden or your perennial bed, the nutrients cannot be taken up unless the pH is around. You can see that that chart right about six point five to seven you get the most absorption or availability of micronutrients and macronutrients if the pH is right. A soil test will tell you what your pH is so that it can be adjusted in order to make absorption of these um, important nutrients possible. So Christina Hastings um, can send you a kit or the Master Gardener Desk uh, can send you a kit to do a soil sample in your own yard. Make sure that you have kept records of what's grown where in your vegetable garden. Uh, keep a little garden journal. This is kind of a pretty one. Um, and with a, maybe with a map of what you planted where so that you cannot plant tomatoes or peppers in, or eggplant in the same spot each year so that because uh, diseases and insects build up in that soil in that area and you'll have a lot more problems. So you wanna rotate your crops by plant family and here, Here's a picture of the families. You can also Google cropRotation.ext and find some uh, other um, good diagrams on this topic. You can put in some fall, fall crops now or between now and um, when fall really arrives. Here's, um, these are some of them. 
and we have a vegetable planting calendar. We can email this to you and it's two-sided. I'm only showing you the first side. We can also email you an, an Excel spreadsheet version of it so you can actually put your own dates in there. And this shows you what, what to plant when and you can see all the, the top, top ones up here in purple. You, you can plant these in, 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 the, in the fall, the cool season ones. And we're having a, a Zoom class on September 16th at 11 o'clock of Hall Vegetable Gardens. So um, email us to register and we'll, um, we can send you the planting calendar, but we can also enroll you in that Zoom class on the 16th. But consider putting cover crops in unused areas. We just, Thomas did a great uh, class on uh, using cover crops on YouTube and it's posted if you can check us out there. Cover crops protect the soil, they add nutrients, they keep erosion down, um, they keep weeds out, and um, they look kind of pretty. I mean, this is hairy vetch with the purple flowers and crimson clover, and this is annual cereal rye. And you can see how um, it can hold the roots and enrich the soil at the same time. You can extend your season. Uh, this is at the teaching garden. This is a season extender with PVC and some reme or um, cover crop, um, cover fabric for your vegetable garden. And you can extend the season. Um, we've had some mild winters, so you can be growing lettuce or greens under this area uh, into the winter months. Or you can make your own coal frame. These are with windows. Um, and there's lots of good um, online versions. This is from... Um, I think this is from Joe, Joel Salatin, Polyface Farm, I, one of those two, but here's the site, Four Season Farm, and here's some, there's any number of um, recommendations for how to extend your season and make a row cover. Here's another picture of an easier one that uh, seems to be simpler and less work. Uh, you can grow some spinach all winter. Now composting, um, let's talk just for a minute about that. Uh, here's Patrick, our compost king. He's a master gardener, and he has some great instructional videos on YouTube. There's one on how to turn a compost pile with Ed mm -hmm. and there's one on vermicomposting or composting with worms. There's also a, a visit to our, our monastery teaching garden compost pile, and it, it's a well-regulated system, and, and Patrick has learned so much and is eager to teach you about that. Um, so until our master gardener um, teaching garden is open, uh, you might want to consider doing some virtual classes from our YouTube channel. Remember not to compost disease materials. Here's some things not to compost. Avoid wood ash. Uh, you, um, a handful or two is okay, but uh, don't add it consistently. I, I would avoid anything that has um, a, a weed seed on it. Particularly, you don't want to compost uh, any invasive plants. Um, and sometimes I'll just leave them out to bake in the sun until I know they're really dead. So a few repairs and chores around the, around the garden. Winterize your hose bibs. Not now, because you're going to be watering your trees, remember, until the, until the ground freezes. But you get ready to winterize your hose bibs if you don't have a winter, winter um, attachment on your hose. In the fall, after you're done mowing, sharpen and clean your blade or take it somewhere to be done and drain your glass before winter. Sharpen and clean your pruners so that they're ready to go. I use my pruners all winter long. So about every two or three months, I sharpen and clean them. And you want to repair or build some garden structures. Look at this cool little trellis made out of sticks and twine, or maybe um, a structure to hold something next year. Particularly when you're cleaning up your yard and you have extra woody material, you might want to consider getting creative and making some kind of garden structure for you to use next year. Very important. It's important to dream and plan for the future. And it, in that plan, you might want to consider scheduling an Audubon at home visit. You can email us and um, that's, a, that's a visit by Master Gardeners to your home, socially distant, wearing masks, uh, you, um, and we can uh, help you decide uh, whether there are native plants that you can add to your, for, to increase the habitat value, um, how to add a water feature, uh, we're not there to judge your landscape. We're there to give you recommendations to make it a sanctuary. So if you're interested in that, you can email us and we'll give you um, the information about how to set up one of those free appointments. Are there plants that are in the wrong place? Every year I have plants that I think I put in the right place, but they're not. So I decide where am I going to move them when the fall weather gets a little more forgiving. 
develop a plan for areas that have been eroded or are bare. You know, what are you gonna put there so weeds don't take over that spot and erosion doesn't occur? How can you make your landscape more sustainable? I'm always looking for ways that I can reduce the maintenance and save my back. And I, I, every year I come up with just a couple and that makes the next season all, all much better. And what plants can you add to your landscape? Can you add some natives? Good old Audrey Hepburn. Gardeners are the best people for, for be believing that tomorrow is gonna be better. Every year about this time I say, oh, but next year is gonna be better than this. And it gives me hope, particularly in these difficult times. And it also helps me to get excited again about gardening because by about August, I'm getting a little tired and of watering and weeding, and I'm already thinking about how I can make next year's garden even better. So we're gonna have some more classes coming up. I'll show you these next few slides and then we'll stop for questions. We have about uh, 10 minutes left. Uh, you can register and receive the link by emailing us. Next uh, Wednesday, Natalie Walker will be talking about turf alternatives. And then August 26, more in depth on planting and caring for trees with Janice Rice. And September 2nd, uh, Fall Bulbs with Kathy Westcott. We have a, a whole bunch more classes coming up after that, but those are the, just the next three for you to put on your calendar. Again, don't forget to check our VCE Prince William YouTube. That's all you have to put in the search terms. And these, these are just a few of the things that are on there. You can click on the videos and see all these, these and many more topics. It's getting to be a full library of really great instructional videos. We're on social media. We have a teaching garden blog that tells you what's happening in our instructional garden. And we're on Instagram, Facebook, two pages on Facebook. We have a master gardener page and a teaching garden page. We're on Twitter. We're on Pinterest and we also have a Master Gardeners of Prince William website. So there's a lot of information on that and we're trying to update them all regularly. So check us out on there. And if you have any questions about landscaping, turf, insects, disease, wildlife, you can always contact our Extension Horticulture Help Desk. Have I said VCE Prince William YouTube enough <laughs> or Master Gardener at pwcgov.org? We are here for a resource for you and it our programs are, for the most part, free. Um, we do have a couple that we charge for materials for, like our water, um, testing your well water. You can inquire about any of our classes or get advice that's research-based uh, by emailing us. Now we'll start with some, any questions in the chat box. I had a question about the underneath the trees. Mm -hmm. So if you put living, can you plant Thomas said if it's shade tolerance, you can plant under a tree, but if you plant things under the tree, does it take up the nutrients the tree needs? Remember the feeder roots are out around the drip line. You know, if you're gonna plant uh, like a ground cover around a tree, you know, plant it away from the trunk, but in that area where it anchors itself. Does that make sense? Well, I, uh, the one comment I would make to that, too, is that if you think about a lot of our shade tolerant ground covers and shade tolerant plants, they co-evolved with trees. And so they're much more likely to be they're much more likely to be tree friendly than, say, turf that evolved to be in full sun. And so there's not as much of a problem with ground covers, particularly our shade tolerant ones. The other thing is our shade tolerant ones aren't going to be sucking up nutrients as quickly as turf. And so that will help with the plants as well. Turf is a very hungry plant. <laughs> Someone was asking about good recommendations for native mid-Atlantic lily bulbs for planting bulbs for planting in the fall. That is not a topic I'm well versed in, but that is something that we can easily research for you. If you could send a, um, a question specifically to the Master Gardener desk and ask that and we can research and, and get you some um, useful information on that. Um, and then do you have a resource for tool sharpening? We really should do another tool sharpening class, but uh, I know there are some online tutorials and honestly, I look at those every year before I do it. Because, and um, there, and I, I have gotten some good suggestions from there on which sharpening uh, tool to use. Um, and I, I, I can't mention names <laughs> because I work for extension, but uh, Google, 
tool sharpening, garden tool sharpening, sharpening.ext. And I know there are some good tutorials on that. The other thing I would add to that is that a lot landscape places, you know, like John Deere dealers, for example, or Toro dealers, uh, a lot of them will do tool sharpening. You can also look um, a lot of a lot of high schools that have agricultural programs. They will do tool sharpening, um, although I'm not sure how that's going to work now since most of them are virtual. But um, that's another resource. Yeah, I usually just take my lawnmower to um, have somebody do it, and I sharpen my hand tools myself. There were uh, a couple of questions about master gardeners doing site surveys in Maryland. And I wanted to mention that the University of Maryland has an excellent master gardener uh, and cooperative extension program. And you can search for that on Facebook. If you're on Facebook, they have a number of pages and you can ask them. The other thing I would add to that is that Maryland, well, extension services in every state are slightly different. With Maryland, a lot of the home and garden questions go through a central hub, whereas in Virginia, a lot of those questions go go to the county directly. Um, I'm not sure what site visit options you do have in Maryland, but if you are here in Virginia, site visits for turf and site visits in generally in general is a county by county thing. So. Um, we typically don't have volunteers go across county lines. There was a question about the social media slide uh, with this, um, your last slide. So we'll put that on our Facebook pages. Can you explain what the drip line is? Yeah. Yeah, let's go back and look at that picture, okay? Where the, so where the leaves come out, that's the drip line, as far as the leaves grow out. And that, but the roots are, extend beyond that. You know, those are the feeder roots that are the ideal watering zone. Can yellow sage be used as a turf alternative? Yellow sage. I don't know yellow sage. I have used thyme as a ground cover, oregano, uh, some of the herbs and sedums. We do have a really nice ground cover um, presentation on YouTube, so you can check that out. But also, um, Natalie will be talking about turf alternatives next Wednesday, too. And that will, if you can't make that, that'll be on our, on our YouTube channel too. How should rising roots of a mature silver leaf maple be handled? The roots are trying to get oxygen. And so that's, that's a normal thing for trees, trees to do is to seek oxy, oxygen from the air and for the roots to be above the surface. You know, it does make a tripping hazard. Don't cover it with, um, with, mulch um well you can cover it lightly with mulch you know a thin layer of mulch but the tree is seeking oxygen in the root zone and silver maples do that more than yeah. any other tree yeah for sure oh yeah hackberry too we do have a question about audubon in terms of site visits i think this is also from the same person who was asking about maryland um mm -hmm. and audubon does uh Audubon at home visits. In some places that's offered in conjunction with extension. In some places it's just through Audubon. But um, Christina just put up the contact information for their website in Maryland. So if you check them out, they can give you a, a better idea. National Wildlife Federation also will uh, certify your yard. They're... I like this question. How can you tell wild ginger from <laughs> wild violet? Well, the wild ginger, it has a more leathery leaf and it's uh, bigger usually than the wild violet. Wild violet, the leaves bend and wild ginger, they're kind of glossy and leathery. But you could send us a picture too. And ginger has a lot of hairs on their stems. Good. Yes, you're right. Violet also grows much closer to the ground. And it has a, the root system is different, but I don't know that you could tell that. Um, I had a Quick question. Um, we have a, a cherry tree um, in the backyard and it has shot hole fungus um, and it's dripping down onto some of my vegetables. So I've been sweeping up the leaves and trying to get rid of those. But is there any suggestion of maybe pruning or I know maybe watering more to help for next season for that tree? Cleaning up is really the way to go. Um, I know that's tedious. Is the, how's the trunk look? Is it oozing? 
The trunk is beautiful. It doesn't seem to be troubled at all. It's, you know, it doesn't have any, it has a nice color. It looks clean. Okay. There is some, um, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the, the ground cover underneath it. We just moved in the house. So it has the, almost like a grass underneath the tree. Lariety, um, maybe. Right. I think it, it's supposed to end up having purple flowers, but yeah, I don't know it. if that's helping cause and continue the spread. Um, is it real fun. dense? Is the liriope real dense? Yes. Yeah. I would maybe thin out the liriope. If the okay. tree looks good, all, you know, cherry trees in Northern Virginia just get that early leaf drop every year. Cherries are not long lived trees. They're beautiful. You know, they're a great tree, but they're not, they're not going to be a long living, they're not going to be like an oak. Okay. So thin out the liriope, make sure you irrigate. Um, clean up the disease leaves as much as you can and, and just enjoy the tree as it is. Okay, thank you. Okay. Cheryl, I, um, the saucer magnolia, this is a really, really hard year. I've had to water my magnolias, you know, more often. It probably has some, um, some you know, heat damage on the leaves. Uh, I would clean up any of them that are diseased that you can reach um, and irrigate. Should I, should I cut the branches that have the diseased leaves on them or just try to get the leaves off? You don't have to work too hard to get the leaves off. They'll, they'll fall off as soon as they're, you know, dried out enough, desiccated. I, okay. My, I had two dogwoods that got anthracnose. Would that, can that affect a um, magnolia? It can, but magnolias, if they get that brown, the brown tips and stuff, it's usually from either cold damage, which we know that's probably not it, or it's from, you know, heat and needing irrigation. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Thank you for coming. Come back. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time. Next Wednesday, we're talking about turf alternatives. So have a good week, and we'll see you then. If you enjoyed this video, Please let us know with your questions, comments, and suggestions. For more information, contact the Horticultural Help Desk at mastergarder at pwcgov.org. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.